Matthew 12, verse 13. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Now listen to this. Verse 15, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. Now, last year, I went through Matthew with my family and our family devotions. And I began, those times Jesus did that sort of thing, told the people not to reveal him, I began to notice how often that was coming up. And I started to take note, and so I actually marked it. Turn back to chapter 8 just a second. And you remember the account here. Here Jesus cleanses a leper. Jesus, verse 3, stretched out His hand, touched Him, saying, I will be clean. Immediately His leper was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. Turn over to chapter 9, verse 30. And their eyes were opened. Here are two blind men. Their eyes were opened and Jesus sternly warned them. Isn't that amazing? It wasn't just don't say anything. He sternly warned them. See that no one knows about it. Now it's true. They went away and spread His fame through all that district. I mean, they obviously had very little... They wanted to be healed. They had very little concern for His authority in their life. But isn't it amazing? See that no one knows about it. And then, of course, you go over to 1216, where we, where we started. He ordered them not to make Him known. Well, brethren, I would ask you this. Why? You tell me this. This, this is, we'll open it up. You tell me why. Doesn't that, to some degree, rattle our perception of Christ. You know, some people have the idea, well, Jesus, you know, His desire is that none should be lost, and so we would think that Jesus would come and that He would want to make Himself known to everybody. That He would go far and wide. For one, Jesus limited Himself, right? He didn't travel the nations of the world. He kept to a very really a very confined region of the world. And then even for that, he was constantly telling people not to, not to let him be known. Do you have any reason, does any reason come to your mind why that would be so? It wasn't his time yet. Now that, that is a biblical answer. And, and I'll show it to you in a second. What were you saying, Chris? He counted equality with God a thing to be grasped. I'm not sure what you mean by that. He didn't. Which means... Humility. And they're definitely... There definitely is that reality as well. You know, one of the things is that verse 17 of chapter 12 says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. What? Well, the most immediate thing right before that, certainly it could be speaking about his healing there, but the most immediate thing is the fact that he ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. And you find out, he says in verse 19, he will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. But this isn't the only time. If you look, look forward now at chapter 16, verse 20. <clears throat> in 16.20, here we have a situation with his disciples where Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, 
And he says, that's right. My father revealed that to you, Peter. Verse 20, then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Look over at chapter 17, verse 9. This, this is after the Mount of Transfiguration. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision. Now watch this. Until. It doesn't say never to tell anybody. Until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Della said his time had not yet come. It's very interesting. Once he was raised from the dead, then these things would be proclaimed, right? But brethren, there's something really interesting in all this to me. And I won't have us turn there, but I just I want you to think about this. You ever think over in John chapter 2, you get towards the end of the chapter, Jesus in, is in Jerusalem, and He did lots of wonders, signs. And there were a lot of people that believed on Him. And you remember what happened? He didn't commit Himself to them. Isn't that interesting? And then... Think with me, as you move forward in John's Gospel, you have the occasion of the woman at the well. You know what's very interesting to me there? Jesus didn't do any signs. And yet, the Samaritans said that they believed Him because of the word that He spoke. You know what's, you know what's very interesting? Jesus was not looking for a bunch of people to follow Him because He was a wonder worker. It was when people believed what he said. That's very interesting because in, as you move forward as well, you remember that the you remember when the centurion came and he wanted Jesus to heal his son, and Jesus rebuked them, and he said, "This generation it seeks a sign." But you know, when Jesus said to him, he wanted Jesus to come to his house, but when Jesus said to him, go, your, your child's been healed, it says that he believed his word. That's very interesting. He charges them for wanting signs. When Jesus got followings because of the signs, now look, true believers of what Jesus has to say, the, uh, true believers of what Jesus says, true believers of the, the Word of God, we're going to believe the miracles as well. But when people are limited to, to the miracle end, and isn't it interesting, really the times He wanted people to stay silent had to do with miracles, right? It never had to do with truth. Simple, the, the simple reality of God, His spoken Word. You think about it. My Father has supernaturally revealed something to you, Peter, that came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. So the supernatural reality that there was a manifestation of Christ up there. There was a manifestation of the voice of God. There was a manifestation of Moses and Elijah. You find that two men had their eyes healed. You find that basically when a man's withered hand is set right, Jesus is telling people, don't say anything. You have a leper that's healed. You know, when you go out and you start proclaiming in this world that miracles are being done, you'll gather a crowd real fast. But it's amazing to me. It's amazing. He goes into Samaria and he doesn't do a single miracle. And yet he's got a revival. And it's real. Where right before that in Jerusalem, many believed on him and he turned his back on them and walked away. Isn't that amazing? I think there's something to that. I think there's something to that as to why Jesus, he, did, he knew that the wonder worker, the word of it would spread and people would come for the wrong reason. But when they came and they believed, and it's interesting, that's, that centurion, he gets rebuked ahead of time. This generation, they, they need signs. But then it says the centurion took Jesus at his word. You know what was interesting when he said, your child is healed? He couldn't see it right there. It was no visible miracle to view. He had to take Christ at his word. And don't we find that that man was saved in his household? Isn't that what it says? 
I reckon. That, that has really jumped out at me. I think, there's, I think it wasn't his time yet, but I think there's a reality to that. Well, anyway, you can, uh, you can study those accounts, but it, it's interesting to see how Jesus responds to when people react to his signs, his miracles, his wonders, versus over against when they believe his word, when they, when they deal with him by faith, not by sight. Miracles produce sight-oriented responses, whereas taking Jesus at his word when we have to trust what we can't see with the eye, there's a big difference between those.